ask a question. <laughs> um, you can upvote it. Let me just say I got this. You can upvote it by um, clicking on the thumbs up next to the question. And that way, that question will move to the top. So the more popular questions will move to the top. So instead of asking the question again, just upvote it by clicking the thumbs up. I will try to remember to, if you put your name, to say your name, who's asking the questions, but I apologize if I don't. Um, also, after the event, we'd love to, you to take a short survey. So, you know, it's again, it's about learning information, getting all the knowledge, but taking action. And part of the way we do that is we have a survey where we ask you what actions are you going to adopt that you commit to adopting, adopting after this um, screening. So I'm going to be sending you out a survey. We're actually going to put the link at the end and you can... Um, you can respond to it right away, or you can respond to it um, later, and I'll give you the timeline for that. Um, everyone who completes the survey will be entered into a prize drawing to win one of three great prizes. So unfortunately, this is mainly for local LA people because um, one of the prizes is a farmer's market uh, gift card, and I can't I can send it to you, but you can't use it because it's only for Santa Monica Farmer's Market. But three lucky windows will each win um, a gift certificate, the Santa Monica Farmer's Market, and a book. Uh, the first book is the companion book to the film called Eating Our Way to Extinction, Understanding the Problems and Solutions, which Gerard was uh, had a part in writing. So one person will win that. Uh, the second one is a book called The Recipe for Survival, written by our panelist, Dana. Um, Ellis Hunis, so someone will win that and she signed that copy. And then Eating for Tomorrow, um, which introduces plant-based cuisine from across cultural uh, multicultures, part of the film as well. Uh, the third person will be winning that. So someone will get a cookbook so they could start uh, creating some uh, plant-based uh, dinners, meals right away. So enough from me. Oh, so anyway, so if by June 10th, I think it's June 10th, yes, it's a week from this Friday. If you fill out the survey, you will be entered into that prize drawing. So three people will win. And I didn't include it in the survey if you respond to it right away, but I'm gonna add it. So in the like comments that you can make, if you can let me know if you watched this, um, if you use the Spanish subtitles. So we wanna see if people were using it, the subtitles because it's something we will continue to use as long as we do virtual screenings. So if you do the survey right away, please somewhere in the comments comment whether yes or no you, you use the, um, Spanish subtitles, uh, Spanish interpretation. I'd appreciate that. Okay, so enough of me talking, let's get on with the panel. So I'd like, please to introduce our moderator, Sarah Spitz. Sarah has moderated quite a few films for us, so we're really happy to have her back. Uh, for 28 years, Sarah Spitz was a producer and publicity director for KCLW Public Radio, as well as a freelance arts producer for NPR. In 2020, she wrapped up an eight-year stint writing a weekly arts and culture column for the Santa Monica Daily Press. In 2006, she became a University of California Master Gardener for Los Angeles County and was certified in 2011 as a UC Master Food Preserver. She is currently a member of the Kitchen Cabinet Advisory Board for Food Forward, a nonprofit organization that prevents food waste by rescuing surplus produce to feed those in need in eight Southern California counties. In May 2022, Food Forward celebrated a milestone, recovering 250 million pounds of fresh, of fresh produce, providing more than 1 billion servings of fresh fruit and vegetables no, donated to more than 2 million recipients through a network of more than 1,800 partner agencies and in eight con, uh, country, counties. And I wanna add that that's an important thing that we can do is we can stop food waste because if we don't waste the food, that's less food that we have to produce. So that's less resources used to create that. So that's a really important thing. And one of our um, action items, um, I mentioned was how you can prevent food waste. So um, welcome, Sarah, and I'm take, let, take it away. Gina, can you guys hear me? First question, okay. Yes, <laughs> Thank you uh, so much for these opportunities that Sustainable Works has given to me to learn new things about how to make our planet a better place for everyone. And this movie, <laughs> there was a lot I just did not know before, and I will be far more conscientious about going forward. I'm going to introduce our panelists. 
Joining us all the way from Australia, where it's been tomorrow for almost 12 hours, is Gerard Wedderburn Bishop, who worked as a principal scientist with Queensland Government Natural, excuse me, Natural Resources, using satellite data to monitor three decades of vegetation cover and broad scale deforestation. He left government in 2010 to co-author Beyond Zero Emissions Land Use Plan, a plan to take Australia's land use and agriculture admissions beyond zero, and he works pro bono with the NGO World Preservation Foundation, focusing on deforestation, land degradation, and biodiversity loss. He is on the Zero Emissions Byron. Byron is the northeast tip, I believe, of New South Wales. Uh, the, the Zero Emissions Byron Land Use Advisory Panel, and he's a director of Replant Byron. He's also co-author of the book that accompanies this documentary, Eating Our Way to Extinction. A little bit closer to home, Christine Tran is a first generation high school graduate graduate from South El Monte, California. She's executive director of Los Angeles Food Policy Council, the largest food policy council in the country. She is the daughter of refugees. Her mother worked in sweatshops, her father a day laborer. Christine was a former WIC baby and free lunch student who grew up in a CalFresh household. She is committed to increasing healthy food access, expanding local opportunities, and building healthy communities through inclusive policies and programs. Her diverse background in education and food justice has taken her across the country and around the world. As a multimedia storyteller, she aspires to create narratives to deepen our understanding of each other, the food we eat, and the world we share. Christine is a graduate of UCLA, me too, Columbia University, and is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Washington. And for those of us on the West Side, even closer is Dana Ellis Hunnis. She got a lot of initials after her name. You got your PhD, your MPH, your RD. She's a senior dietitian at UCLA Medical Center, assistant professor at UCLA's Fielding School of Public Health, author of Recipe for Survival, What You Can Do to Live a, live a Healthier and More Environmentally Friendly Life by Cambridge University Press this year, 2022. Dr. Hunnis is a climate change, food security, and plant-based vegan advocate. She teaches courses on plant-based nutrition, the prevention of chronic disease, and climate change at UCLA. Dr. Hunnis did her climate research in Ethiopia and has been advocating for plant-based diets ever since. She is frequently cited in the media, including Discover Magazine, Healthline, Consumer Reports, KTLA's series on plant-based milks, Huffington Post, Washington Post, and The Hill. I'm gonna start the conversation off with Gerard. I noticed that at the bottom of your emails, next to each other are the film's title, Eating Our Way to Extinction, and the words, Eating for Tomorrow. That's a perfect lead into this question. In a film like this that confronts so hard the issue of deforestation and animal agriculture, so hard, I cried watching it. How serious are these threats? And in the face of what appears to be potential disaster, what can we do to stay positive and find ways to make things better? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And thank you, Gina and Sustainable Works for holding this event. Um, yes, this is a very serious predicament we face. It's quite confronting. Um, but I want to talk to those people who uh, are confronted about it, that the, the main message of this documentary is actually empowering. This is the defining decade, this decade. We have overstepped the environmental limits of many systems that support life on Earth. Um, species loss, climate change, forest loss, water pollution, nitro nitrogen pollution, ocean dead zones. These things are not some interesting academic um, study. They're the, they're the systems that support us in our life on planet Earth. So we need these systems functioning well to support our own lives. If they collapse, we die off. We are part of the web of life. We depend on it for our own survival. For example, we've killed off about 70% of the wildlife on planet Earth. And you can't do things like that without some kickback. So how do we fix that? The most wasteful, destructive and polluting activity we do on planet Earth is to raise animals to eat. 
just because we've been doing it for a long time doesn't mean that we need to continue to do it. In fact, if you just look at the land that we use, by far the greatest proportion of the land we now devote to grazing animals. Mm -hmm. So what do we get from that red meat and dairy? And half the world's crops are devoted for uh, feed for animals, not feed for humans, even though that only gives us a small percentage of our food. So rewilding even half the land now devoted to animals would increase the wildlife habitat manyfold. It would soak up legacy carbon emissions and solve many other crises. Every tree is precious. Every bit of habitat is critical. So that makes this message actually empowering. We have the power to give our kids a future they can look forward to. So it's actually a positive message in this. So I'm sorry if those, for those people who watch the movie and they're, they're upset by it. It is, it's very upsetting, but we do hold the power to fix it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Gerard. Um, Christine, uh, Dana, do either of you want to add anything to that? Dana yeah. does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to jump in on this. Um, I 100% agree with everything Gerard said. And um, I just want to add that, yeah, you know, when I saw the film, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like there are other people in the, in the world who get it, who understand the gravity of the situation that we are facing. And they put it into such beautiful imagery that regardless of how hard I tried in my book, I just couldn't, I couldn't manage because in a book you're, you're working with words versus images. So for me, seeing this film, of course it is depressing and it is hard to watch, but to me it's extremely empowering because it's telling us exactly the problems we face. It's educating us. It is enlightening us for those of us who didn't know what we need to do. And so it is really exactly as Gerard said, it's very empowering because it's saying, hey, now that you know, you can take the next step and you can do what we need to do to protect the planet. And he's absolutely right. If, if everyone on the planet were to go plant-based tomorrow, we would need only one quarter of the amount of land that we currently use today to grow all of our food. So, I mean, it's, it's truly astounding what we can do. Christine, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to add that um, one, one way to look at it is that global is local and local is global. And it's hard for us as consumers to wrap our heads around the gravity of what this film is discussing because we're so far removed from where our food comes from. And being able to have media such as this to have conversations, spark dialogues and just learn a little bit more about where our food comes from, not just the, the product, but the process, I think will make a big difference. Um, I suppose we've more or less addressed this question in, in the answer to the previous question, but what is the biggest obstacle standing in the way of changing our dietary habits globally right now? Uh, let me turn first to Dana, and then we'll come back to Gerard and Christine. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I do argue that it's multifactorial. We can't just say it's one person or, or, you know, that that is the one obstacle. It's really, there's governmental policies in place that basically fund the destruction of the planet. I mean, here in the United States, and I'm sure in other countries, uh, Gerard could probably speak to Australia. Um, you know, we actually give money to farmers to raise these animals that are so destructive. Um, it's the education that we're taught in schools. I mean, unfortunately, my son, who's only eight years old, went on a virtual dairy farm tour. And I was, you know, livid about that. I'm like, why are we, why are we teaching this to our children? And that's just because that's where the funding comes from. It's politics. Um, it's social and cultural preferences. But again, a lot of that is taught. And it can be retaught or differently taught. Um, and then again, knowledge. If you don't know, it's really hard to act on things that we're not aware of. Gerard, do you want to take it from there? Um, yeah, perhaps I should let the others talk on this, but uh, yeah, definitely. The, the, the meat eating culture is pervasive right through our civilization. And as countries become more affluent, the meat 
eating rate goes up and up and up. China now uh, consumes more meat than any other country, even though their per person consumption is only three quarters or less of the um, of the US, for example. But um, you know these these attitudes like uh, feed the man meat. You know, you need to be strong. You need to eat meat to be strong. That that sort of thing. Um, but they they are right through our culture, and it's it's all. As, as Arnie Schwarzenegger says, it's marketing, not fact. So um, we need to address that. And I think this documentary does goes part way towards that, but there are many other documentaries and most, a lot of material out there as well. Um, but we've got to open the conversation. We've got to talk about these hard issues because if we do that, if we change away from animal products, the, the, the differences to our environment, to our future, for our grandkids' future will be profound. The, the, we will have a planet for the future. We can actually make carbon dioxide a short-term greenhouse gas if we want. If we turn back the world's pastures, or half of the world's pastures, back to forest, which is what it was before, we can actually draw down all the legacy carbon dioxide. This is staggering. It's huge. It's little discussed. We don't talk about it, but it, it is so powerful. And, and uh, thank God we've got these sort of conversations to address that. Christine, I'm gonna address this question to you with a perspective on Los Angeles. What are we doing here to try to change our dietary habits? What is, what is Food Policy Council advocating for? And what do you know of efforts in Los Angeles that are taking place that would help people to learn all of these damaging details about what animal agriculture is doing to the planet and to us. As an, uh, an educator, I, I really think it's important for us to teach, not just to young folks, but of, to everybody, like where our food comes from through practices like gardening and agriculture. Um, one of uh, the working groups that we currently um, support is our farm to school and garden working group. And um, it's important for folks to know that it takes three years from seed to spear for asparagus to grow and for a carrot to take almost four months to reach maturity. And again, process is product and we don't normally understand or teach those things. And there's joy and delight in this work too, where you know to see a young person or someone older pull a carrot out, not knowing what it's gonna look like um, and I think there is joy in food and we, we've been missing that part. Um, and it's really easy to find like not, you know, when we talk about different diets, processed foods, um, it's so much easier to find a bag of chips than an mm. apple in a lot of our communities. Um, uh, actually, my background right now is Hank's Mini Market in South Los Angeles in the Hyde Park community. And um, a lot of our corner stores do want better practices for procurement. How do you buy food to stock in the store? And um, a lot of our corner stores, they just struggle with finding fresh produce. Um, I was in Mid-City recently and um, the store owner has to go twice a week to the produce terminal market in order to buy fresh produce. And that means he has to wake up before eight o'clock, go really early in the morning. Um, and we, we also have some corner store owners who can't afford to leave their stores at all. And so they'll go to Ralph's or a big chain store mm -hmm. to buy five lemons and six to, you know, potatoes just to have in the store for their customers. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, when we think about the supply chain, we're not actually looking at it from a common sense lens. Um, a lot of the big box stores, they procure bananas a whole year in advance. And so when we look at how food is purchased, um, we don't actually follow the food in a way that we should. Um, the majority of the blueberries we consume here in Los Angeles are likely from Peru and California blueberries are um, shipped to other places um, in the United States, displacing uh, Michigan blueberries, for instance. And so when we think about eating local, it's all of us trying to eat local and um, when we follow the supply chain, I wonder what Peru is growing for Peruvians <laughs> while we are eating, you know, fruit and, and labor and, and resources coming from 
that corner of the world. And so these are pieces of the food chain that we have to talk about. I don't know uh, who wants to answer this. I'm gonna, we're gonna go popcorn. You can, you can choose yourself on this one. A recent computer modeling study by the journal Nature showed that deforestation could be cut in half if just 20% less meat was consumed globally, which would also reduce carbon and methane, uh, methane, as you, as you Australians say, methane emissions. <laughs> Is that enough to turn things around or at least to get a jump on moving in the right direction? Who wants to go first on this one? Um, well, I could, I could address that initially. Um, definitely, it, that'd be a huge start. That shows the power of just changing a little what we do. You know, we, we, if we can reduce deforestation that much just through that small change, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a big change? So, so that demonstrates beautifully the power of our food choices on the environment, definitely. Who wants to go next? I would add that, you know, for sure it is a great start, but the idea of, yes, you know, slowing down deforestation is important, but going back to Gerard's prior point on another question, we not only need to stop deforestation, we need to reforest and rewild and rehabitate the land that we have destroyed. So, you know, I think 20% is a good starting spot, but I think there's a lot more room to continue moving that forward so that we get to where we need to be with that closer to, you know, the rewilding and the rehabitating and um, all of that other stuff that needs to happen for a healthy planet. So I would argue it's, you know, it's a good place to begin to move the needle but we need to take it beyond that. Christine, you wanna weigh in on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll add another dimension again with localizing our supply chain. Another working group that we facilitate is our urban agriculture working group. And it's supporting master gardeners like yourself, Sarah, and other um, folks in the community to really create a culture around growing our own food. And we talk about food sovereignty this is where it comes from. How do we share the practice of growing food? Um, I came from a family of refugees and what we couldn't find in the grocery stores, we would grow um, because culturally it was important for my family to have herbs and vegetables that were um, so connected to, to our family culturally. And so, you know, really figuring out what that looks like um, is really important as well, because it's not just where we get our food all the time. Every, everything um, we eat comes with a price. And so um, having a more localized food chain will allow us to um, just be green in so many other ways. Um, I, again, being um, from a family of refugees, I love fish sauce. So that's going to have to come from Vietnam. Um, uh, <laughs> people love coconuts and coconut water. And so there are things that we have to be really critical about in terms of our diet um, because it has this um, effect, a ripple effect of where our food comes from, how we use our land in order to get that food. Um, and, and all of this is interconnected. I, today I used a vegan butter on my toast and I thought, I'm gonna look at the ingredients here. Top of the list, palm oil, in addition to other oils. I gotta wonder, if, isn't palm oil also a reason for deforestation? How can producers of vegan products, it, it, it's so ironic to say vegan and processed in the same sentence, but there it is. How can producers of vegan products become more conscientious about their eco practices and the ingredients that they use? Can I address that to Dana, who has uh, you know the nutritional handle going? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's again, it's a, it's a multifaceted approach. As consumers, you know, we in part are voting with our dollar or whatever other currency that we may be using um, when we buy our products. So if we are buying a product from a company that uses palm oil, for example, we're saying, you know what, I'm okay with your product, keep going, keep doing it as it is. But if we demand change, if we request change or we stop buying that product and we buy other products that don't use those ingredients, then I think companies are more likely to get that message. Um, so I think that's one thing that uh, 
producers can do. Um, and also I think there, there ought to be some, some sort of ethical considerations by producers. You know, that's, I guess, ultimately on them. But I would hope that producers who want to entice consumers um, would hopefully look at that ethical standpoint and say, is what I'm doing a good thing, a bad thing? Do I want to be supporting deforestation in Sumatra or in Indonesia where it's hurting orangutans and um, you know, other very in endangered species? So I think you know, there, it has to come from both sides. And ultimately, as the consumer, we, I think, hopefully have a bigger um, choice by by deciding what we are going to spend our money on. I'm going to leave that question to you, Dana, because we're running out of time for this segment of the of the program. But I, I do want to ask all of you this question, and if you can answer as briefly as you can. Since the movie raised the issue of, of plant-based burgers, how eco-friendly, how sustainable are substitute or lab-raised proteins and all the variations on the Impossible Burger and similar products? Who wants to take that first? I certainly can if, if you guys want me to. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I, I would say from an environmental standpoint, they will use far less water, far less land, produce far fewer emissions than the same you know, beef burger. So from an environmental standpoint, they are a boom. From a health standpoint, I do not call them a health food and I do not recommend people eat them on a daily basis. They are a processed food. So that's how I look at them. I say, if you wanna be doing a more environmentally friendly thing, go with the plant-based burger. If you want to be doing a healthier thing, maybe look for a bean burger or something a little bit mm. less processed. Okay. Uh, Gerard, do you wanna weigh in on that too? Um. Yeah, uh, there's lots to be said on that, um, and and I was just I was just playing through in my mind. One of the comments was about regenerative farming. That is the, the <laughs> that is uh, such a obfuscation. Um, it's been hijacked by the cropping movement, but regenerative farming. There's a there's a report out of Oxford Uni called Grazed and Confused. <laughs> and it says that, yes, it's, it's great to increase soil carbon and that can be done. Um, pretty soon it saturates, but none of those systems can uh, equal the emissions above ground. And of course, what, what I was saying before about re rewilding that land is that the, the greatest power of the land that we have, the greatest, our greatest tool to combat climate change is trees. And if we can turn land back to forest, wow, um, the, the, the studies have come out that showed since we started agriculture about 10,000 years ago, we've released more emissions through deforestation than we have through fossil fuels. I mean, IPCC starts at 1750 or 1850 for a lot of their work, but they don't go back further. And you know, the power of trees is incredible. And, and what do we use? 40% of the land surface now, we use it for grazing animals. It's, it's incredibly wasteful. If we can turn half that land back to forest, we can fix the climate. We can fix the biodiversity with all that habitat. We can fix the water cycles. We can fix a lot of the other things like nitrogen pollution. So, um, yeah, it, it's not good enough to say regenerative farming is going to save us. It's not. I see, we're going to skip, skip, uh, Sarah, we're we're, skip you because we're at time and we want to ask the audience we'll questions and I can, yeah, we will come back, Sounds but we good. have a lot of questions from the audience right now. Um, I just have a couple things to say because I listen, I'm like, oh, I want to jump in, but I'm not a panelist, but a couple things. Uh, Earth Balance, my daughter just is making a cake for her sister who can't eat dairy and who's graduated from college and is coming home. And she used Earth Balance and I read it, palm oil. Miyoku's butter is the best vegan butter that you can get has no palm oil. Two, there's nothing like going to your garden and getting a fresh tomato or fresh basil. It's just amazing. We all need to do that more. And the third thing, plant-based diet, there's, not, there's nothing that has so many positive impacts. It impacts the environment, it impacts the animals in, in nature, it impacts the animals that are being abused, and it impacts your own 
personal health. So doing a plant-based diet, you're killing four birds or more with one stone. I shouldn't be saying that talking about our environment, not killing birds, but it, that one action does has so many positive uh, repercussions. And if we all choose to move more in that direction, we don't have to become vegan, it's such an impact. So that was my little spiel that I had to give, but um, I'm gonna take a question. Um, Martha Bardak, and this, I'm gonna answer, said, what was the website at the end of the film? Can you post that in the chat? I've been trying to find it, Martha, but I don't wanna to go to the film because I don't wanna mess up the what's going on here. So I will include that in the email that I send to all participants. I will include that link uh, for you so that you can go and, and have more of an impact. Um, Anne Arquette Niederberger says, is there research on the most effective ways to encourage people to eat less animal meat? Um, Susan responded, be an example yourself, but does anyone have a thought on that? I think um, just being able to share and educate each other. Um, we do a lot of cooking demos um, as much as we can. I know it's been challenging with the pandemic, but really teaching folks how to um, uh, identify locally grown produce and how to cook it. Um, I recently taught my parents how to cook leeks because they randomly found them in the supermarket. And if no one teaches you how to cook something you've never seen, the likelihood of you picking it up is very low. And so um, again, education is really key for me when it comes down to like, what does it mean to actually have a plant forward diet? Yeah, and another thing that I recommend is um, not only leading by example and, and practicing it yourself, but uh, you know, for people who are very new and, and novice in this realm, is you know, if you have a favorite recipe, I always recommend go to Google or go to your favorite search engine and type in my my favorite recipe, and then add the word vegan or plant based to it, and you know, you'll probably find like thirty different recipes that are going to be very much like what you are accustomed to tasting. Cause a lot, for a lot of us, food is cultural. Food is, you know, preferences, food is family. Um, and so it's really important to take that uh, knowledge and work it into something that will be accepted by your own taste buds and by your family. And then also getting the family involved. We get our eight year old and pick out vegetables from our, you know, our um, community garden up on campus, or we get a CSA box and he helps us pick through it and figures out, okay, what's this this week? What's a parsnip? How do we cook this? You know, so just, I think the more involvement and the more camaraderie, the, the better. Um, and added to that to say, I'm asking, this is the person who asked the original question. I'm asking about scientific studies about what is most effective. Are there any? Mm -hmm. Um, as an educator, um, a lot of there's uh, growing research on how school gardens um, not only improves um, a child's understanding of where their food comes from, but it also helps inform them to be better eaters. Um, there are um, a lot of studies out there when kids are able to grow the food that they eat, they're more likely to try it um, versus um, saying, oh, I don't like broccoli. I don't like peas and carrots. It's like, oh, I grew this. Let me taste it. Um, so a lot of it is that exploration. I actually personally used to hate tomatoes and I realized that all of the tomatoes I've ever eaten up until the point I had a fresh one was all um, just uh, not good tomatoes. They were milly. I thought milly was what a tomato was supposed to be. And then I ate a fresh tomato for the first time and it tasted like candy. And I didn't realize a fresh tomato could taste like that. And so um, going to the local farmer's market, being able to um, buy food fresh from the farm, I think um, are really good models. Um, at um, a lot of our farmer's market here locally, we have market match. And so if you are on CalFresh or WIC, you're able to use your benefits um, at um, the farmer's markets. And in addition, um, you can actually use your CalFresh benefits to buy seedlings and seeds if you want a home garden as well. Um, I just want to add... Uh, uh, Gina, I, do you want to add? Because I, I, I wanted to add one thing, but go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. You're I, I just wanted to tell you that at the end of my class, which was 2006 in the Master Gardener training program, one of our students, Herb Macklater, who's become the school garden uh, orchardist, um, had been working at New Road School, teaching children how to grow food. And this one little boy who had never grown anything, always thought that food came from stores, came time to harvest this carrot. The kid pulls it out of the ground, washes it, puts it in his mouth, eats it. His eyes go super wide and he goes, 
can I have another one? It was the most, it, it's so magical. That story just really, really brought me to tears. Anyway, so I will let you speak now, Gina. Um, we have done some classes and learn about behavior change. That's what we do. We get people to change their behavior. So studies have found that one is when people make a commitment, a public commitment, they are more likely to change their behavior, whether it's eating less meat or any other thing that we encourage people, action we encourage people to take. Um, that's why we do this in our survey and ask what actions are you committing to? Number two is peers. People will do what their peers are doing. So um, that works in our student program. So it's students working, talking to students about what they're doing. So studies have found that peer uh, pressure sort of, or being like your peers will change your behavior. And the third, third one is um, removing barriers. So making it e as easy as possible. Um, and I think with a lot of more talk about vegan options or vegetarian options, my twin sister is a big meat eater. And she said, I will, I have no problem eating non-meat as long as it tastes good. So people still have the mindset that food, uh, sometimes vegan food tastes like, you know, the twigs on your, in your, in the forest or something, but having the, removing the barrier by making alternatives just as good. And I think this is Dana was saying is you have a, a plant-based meal. What's the vegan or vegetarian, uh, you have a, sorry, meat-based meal. What's the ve vegan or vegetarian option that tastes just as good. So removing barriers, so making it easier following what your peers are doing and making a commitment are ways that people will change their behavior. Okay, Zen Honeycutt, and I don't know if anyone will know the answer to this, but her question is who is funding this film? She just talks about, you know, GMOs are, are um, is there a promoter of GMOs, uh, uh, which are gen genetically modified, they contain toxic chemicals. So you're just concerned with who is, if someone has some um, skin in the game, who's promoting the film, does anyone know? Uh, yeah, perhaps I can answer that. Um, it's been privately funded. Uh, you can see the executive, the list of executive producers at the back, and um, Kate Winslet's name is the first. So I suspect that she funded the most. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, privately backed. I think they're hoping to get their money back, but um, I don't know if they will. Um, which brings me to an interesting new a bit of news. Um, uh, soon, I believe, the documentary will be coming out on YouTube, uh, funded by ads through through YouTube, through the, the, the plane. So um, hopefully that'll reach a, a greater audience. But um, the people who are behind this are, well, quite worried about the future of our planet and what we can do to fix it. And uh, as as am I, that's the um, uh, that's a critical thing. I mean, um, you've got to you've got to look at funding where that comes from because most funding is industry or government. I used to work in government, and there's a revolving door between industry and government. I've seen that um, the meat and livestock producers fund a lot of the governments, so everything is tainted. So you definitely look at funding. But in this case, it's uh, it's individuals, it's not corporations. Yeah, I was actually going to say the second half of what you said is a lot of nutrition studies that are out there and claim, you know, dairy is good for this, eggs are good for that. You have to look at what, who is funding them because it is very often um, a company that, or an industry that wants to sell that product. So. Um, you know, in this particular case, since I am fully and very well knowledge on the data and information that was presented in the, in the film, and I certainly have no conflict of interest, um, can vouch and say that it's a very well done and conflict of interest free film. Um, whereas there's a lot of nutrition studies and other studies out there um, that unfortunately are funded by industry and not so um, unbiased. Um, and this is going to connect to the next question, but I think maybe Kate Winslet should talk to her Hollywood friends about not doing got milk commercials. Um, which, this is from Dorna Sakura, Sakura uh, which non dairy beverage is considered the most environmentally friendly? I think any, uh, any milks that are not made from uh, cows. Uh, way more environment, as, as um, stated in the film. If you move from um, beef, for example, to chicken and so on, 
it's a it's a one in ten times reduction in the environmental impact. If you go from uh, meats to uh, plant based, it's a one in a hundred time reduction in environmental impact. So that's about what we have for um, uh, that's about what we have for for those milks. But the interesting thing, I, I read a study that came out just last week. And they, it was from New Zealand Daring. Daring's a huge industry in New Zealand. And this, these, they had done, and this applies to the comments before on industry. Industry had done several studies on, on water use per litre of um, uh, milk produced. And what they found was that the, the greatest water use in the dairying industry was not how much they feed their cattle. It was not how much uh, irrigation they they put out on the on the pastures. I mean, this is green pasture fed dairy. It was the amount of water needed to water down the waste, so that it was um, uh, so that it could be absorbed by the ecosystems, by the rivers and streams downstream, and the and the amount of water use went up by a factor of ten. So <laughs> we've got to be very careful about how much water these things uses, and it's often understated. So yes, any plant um, milks have got to be less than dairy, but someone else might have some other figures they can share. The, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Well, I was going to share that uh, the research is um, still like out there for a lot of products, because um, there seems to be more and more products coming out, pea milk, hemp milk. Um, and so, um, growing up, my grandma used to make soy milk and, um, the, again, learning where your food comes from is so important because you actually get to see how it's made. It's not like, oh, here's an almond, almond, here's almond milk. Now almond milk takes a lot of water and not only to grow the almond, but also to dilute it in order to make the almond milk itself. Um, and oat milk, for instance, because it requires less water to grow oat than let's say an almond. Um, it's responsible from the last time I checked uh, a recent study about 80% less submission um, than uh, dairy milk um, or cow's milk. And so even the word dairy is being debated right now. What, what is dairy um, and what is non-dairy and what is milk? Um, so I think we live in a really interesting age of terms and definitions. Um, and this is definitely up there. And then just to conclude that question, I suppose, um, yes, so I would say based on the re research I've read, um, you know, on average, non-dairy milks require about one third of the amount of water um, as dairy milk. So that's a big significant savings. And yes, Christine is right, almonds do require quite a bit of water, but when you're still comparing that to dairy, it's still about half as much water. And then oat and soy milk are about one tenth as much water as dairy, um, and then still the amount of land and emissions reduction use, um, again, for uh, the non-dairy milk, significantly lower, soy and oat, I believe, are the lowest. Okay, we have about, thank you, we have three minutes left. This is from Mi, uh, Miki Yoshimoto. I am very intrigued by the Norwegian fishery industry and how they are marketing their salmon in particular. Can you talk a little bit about how certain companies are falsely marketing their fish as wild? when in fact they are farmed. Also, I may have missed this part in the film, but can we trust the label sustainably farmed? I can take the, I'll, I can go first. Go um, well, I think, I think it's um, a travesty if companies are uh, completely misleading consumers and saying that something is wild caught when it's clearly not. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the fishing industry is notorious for mislabeling and kind of obfuscating where they're getting their products from because it travels halfway around the world and then back halfway around again. Um, and as far as is it possible to have sustainable aquaculture, my inclination is to say no, it is not really possible. However, there are some papers out there that talk about multi-trophic offshore um, systems where literally like the, the grass or the grain growing on top of the water can feed the fish that then feed back into the system. And so that is really hard to find. 
but that would be the only type of aquaculture system that I have heard of and am aware of that would potentially be considered sustainable. And again, this is, I think, related to knowing definitions and knowing terms. Um, uh, another um, example that um, if we think about it, like cage-free eggs versus um, pasture-raised versus um, free range, a lot of consumers are unsure about these terms, but when you see products being labeled a certain way, um, it is part of um, the regulation and specifications that a lot of companies have to adhere to in order to have compliance. But then at the other side of it, on the consumer side, um, it's really important for us to know the difference when we see a label so that we don't fully trust the label, but we, we are actually informing ourselves on what it means to actually buy a product. And um, as Dana mentioned, it's we're buying with our dollars. That economic power is what is creating these industries to want more of our money. And um, we vote with our dollars because that's how economically businesses are sustained. And um, that's why we have a, a lot of milk to um, experiment as consumers. Um, what's the best latte milk? What's the best, you know, fill in the blank? I feel like a lot of us are trying to figure out what that balance is. And there's markets around trying to figure that out. Um, I'm so sad to say that we're done with, there was like 30 something, there were so many more uh, great questions, but unfortunately we're out of time for that. So we're going to go back to Sarah to ask a couple, we have about 11 minutes left and to ask a couple more questions that she has. Well, I, uh, you know, God, I'm so, when I first heard about this film, the first thing, of course, I go on the internet because I want to see who's written about it. Who, what are people saying about it? There is so little out there. There are virtually no reviews. The only reviews that I remember seeing were in the vegan press. Uh, it, it's infuriating when that kind of thing happens. And especially when you have a Kate Winslet, uh, you know, as an executive producer, as a, as a, the narrator, I, you know, why, I don't think you guys can answer this. I, and I don't think I can answer this, I, but what do you think the media reluctance is covering things like this. I mean, on the, on the uh, you know, Tom Brady is, is a very plant-based football player, for God's sake, he's like the leading football player. There's a number of the Tennessee Titans football team who've gone vegan or plant-based. What, how do we get this onto the media's radar as being more important than, than they're making it? I'll, I'll go. Um, Sarah, that is the million dollar question that I I've been asking for like five, maybe even eight or 10 years now. Um, how do we make this salient with people? Because it is, it's a really big deal and it keeps me up a lot of nights. Um, and to that point, I actually did write a review of the film, of the documentary after um, seeing it. Probably about five people read it. It's on Medium, but um, I, I had nothing but wonderful things to say about it. And I think we're still in a kind of this time frame in life where the big stories are still fossil fuels, are still um, transportation and kind of those big ticket items that we've been talking about for 30, 40 years. And it's only recently, I think, that we're really starting to understand the consequences of our eating habits of agriculture. And so I think hopefully within the next five years, fingers crossed, this will become a more salient issue and it will be in the media more. And there will be more people talking about it and people will come back to this film and we'll come back to the book and we'll come back to my book as well that talks about all these issues and the light will go on. <coughs> Javar, do you have any take on this? Um, sorry, I was, I was answering one of the comments. Um, <laughs> That's okay. No, you don't, don't worry about it. it, it I mean, because yeah, we're, no, all, no. we're all in the on. same boat. Uh, you know, we don't know how to get the media to pay attention. You know, it, it, it's, I, it's very frustrating as having been in the media. It's especially frustrating for me. Um, were you going to actually say something as I stepped on you, Gerard? <laughs> uh, well, it's all about money at the end of the day. Um, it, these things, um, I, I, you know, the, 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 what do they call it? Carnism, the, the filter through which most of us look at the world is through the filter of 
oh, I like my steak. I'm not going to give that up. Mm. And um, that's all pervasive. And not, not only the ones who are funded by these industries, but, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's our view of ourselves. And we can change that, definitely. I mean, you look at the American cowboy, the uh, Australian outback cowboy. Um, it's all built around cattle. And this is the image that we have of ourselves. We, we, need, we can change that. It's, it's, it's not hard because we've always done the same thing doesn't mean that we can't change. Uh, it just provides it. We've, we've got to battle that. And, um, you know, if it weren't a, a tough battle, then it wouldn't be worth fighting, right? Is that an <laughs> Elon Musk thing? You're an optimist. I appreciate <laughs> that. It's so hard to be one of those in this world that we live in. In. Christine, do you have anything further that you'd like to add to this? And if not, we'll just move on to the very last question. Yeah, I, I, a lot of this, I, there's so much about our attention span now as a society. I feel like um, longer format movies are harder for a lot of folks to sit through. Um, more right. folks are looking at smaller, like docu-series style um, of storytelling. Um, I also think it's really hard for folks to question, as Gerard mentioned, um, culture and the food that we eat, um, because we're also questioning other things about ourselves, and um, and and it's a, it is a difficult conversation to have. Um, I feel like um, for me, I, my my parents are Buddhists, and so when my mom went um, vegan, it was easier for her because culturally, it's within our family to either eat plant based uh, plant based diet or a meat based diet it's, we're very accepting of different types of diets. Whereas I think certain households, it's different, especially when we think about family gatherings of how do you support um, the one vegan that's going to Thanksgiving or um, <laughs> Christmas dinner? Um, what does it mean to um, think about our diets a little bit differently? And um, I think over time things are changing, um, but I, I really like eating whole foods. So really thinking about um, plant-based diets, not related to um, the new label of like vegan-based butters or um, um, you know processed meat patties or faux meat patties. Right. You know what does that mean? So I think just being comfortable with what do I do with this fennel? <laughs> or um, I was re we we um, supported a corner store in El Sereno. I'm in East LA with a farm stand and we had fennel from Lincoln Heights that was grown not far from the corner store. Cool. And the folks were like, what do we do with this fennel? And we also <laughs> had two different size artichokes. It's like, what do you do with the small ones? And, and so just being able to have a conversation about what to do with something um, just made it delightful. And I think um, it is doom and gloom sometimes, but it, it can actually be very pleasant too. And I, I, I choose to focus on as much joy as possible um, because I think that process is much more enjoyable. Um, and it actually can facilitate us having difficult conversations. Um, and even having the space with everyone here um, helps break the ice um, quite a bit. And I think hopefully that will spark some dialogues and, and get people to question, what am I really eating? We all know that the answer to this question is eat more plants, but I want you each to take this and tell us what you think an immediate step that anybody who's listening to this conversation can take to help make a difference, starting with Dana. I knew I was gonna go first. Um, oh gosh, well, I mean, yes. If I had to choose what is the next most important immediate step you could take right now, um, it would be to look at your next meal. And I know that's kind of what you were saying, but it's so true. I mean, literally look at the next thing that you are going to put in your mouth. And is it something that you feel like would be uh, good for your own health, good for the environment, or is it something that maybe you ought to tweak a little bit to make it a little better for your health and a little bit better for the environment? So that is something we can all do literally if not tonight, because I don't know if everyone has had their dinner tonight. And if not, start now. And if not, you can always start first thing in the morning. You're mute, we can't hear you now. <laughs> Let's have Gerard go next. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, 
Uh, the, the thing that we can do on a national level is put a proper price on carbon and um, that would immediately increase the price of beef, for example, um, several times uh, because methane is an incredibly powerful gas. Mind you, that still ignores the uh, opportunity cost of rewilding that land. So that's just methane. But so carbon price is really important. And the, I think the way China and um, Europe are going, the US and other countries like Australia will be forced into putting a carbon price on uh, traded products at least. So that's important. Community levels, plant trees, so important, so important. Have preferably next to other trees, make it habitat and preferably not all the same tree, <laughs> make it biodiverse. Um, this is so important for our future. We, we've killed off nearly three quarters of the wildlife on the planet. Oh. We can't keep doing that. It's going to come back to bite us. Um, yeah, that's all. Christine, we're going to let you take it out, and that'll be the last answer for this evening's panel. Oh, this is hard. Um, <laughs> I just reflect on this. In one generation, we've reduced fruit to a flavor, and that's problematic. And so um, I really would love to encourage folks to really question what you eat and explore um, ways to improve how you eat. And I, you know, again, um, how do we, I love food. Food is so much joy. And um, I don't want to forget that either. And sometimes when you're eating something delicious, you're not going to think about like, you know, is this meat or not meat? It's like, this is just good food. And um, I feel like having good food is available, especially for climate friendly um, processes. And so in order to get there, we need to make that the market and not the market of um, how do we make something taste like meat. So um, there's, there's plenty of things like I want things to taste like a vegetable. I love vegetables. So you know, how do we rethink the way we eat? And I'm turning it back to you now, Gina. Thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Dana. Before I say goodbye, I want to say a couple of things. Susan Fabrican put in the chat, everyone, please endorse the plant-based treaty.org, eat plants, plant trees. I'm not familiar with that, but check it out, plant-based treaty.org. Uh, the three takeaways I have from here is look at your next meal and your next meal and your next meal and see how you can improve it. We're not saying stop eating meat and become a vegan, look at each meal, how can you improve it, plant a tree. And Christine, what I love that you've constantly brought up this whole evening was where does our food come from? And that was basically what this film was about. It was like pulling back the curtains and showing us where our meat comes from and how it gets to us and what it does to us. Uh, and that is so important. So thank you for that, um, that constant message of just learn where your food comes from. I wanna thank you all so much for participating. This has been amazing. We've had like over hundred people and we still have 77 people left. So at, for those 77, I wanna remind you that if you go to the survey, it's um, surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash eating uh, to extinction. Brenda will put it in the chat, but I will email it to you. If you fill out that survey, one of you will win Dana's amazing book. One of you will win the book that uh, Gerard worked on, part of the film, and one of you will work, actually work, uh, win a cookbook to get you started towards a plant-based diet. Uh, you have to fill out the survey by June 10th. If you fill it out tonight, please let me know if you listen to the Spanish translation. Thank you, Laura, for doing the Spanish translation. Um, amazing evening. Thank you, everyone. Uh, oh, one thing I want to say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm working with Dana to potentially do uh, an event in the fall around her book. So like a book club kind of a thing where we discuss her book. Uh, what's the title of your book again, Dana? I don't have it with me. Recipe for Survival, What You Can Do to Live a Healthier and More Environmentally Friendly Life. So, and you could go buy that and you can go to the Eating Our Way to Extinction website and buy the other books if you don't win. Thank you all so much. I so appreciate this. It's been a great evening. Um, eat healthy, eat plant-based. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.